John Quincy Adams and the grandson of President John Adams. Upon entering Harvard University in 1855, Henry's father gave him just one single challenge. Son, he said, it's your responsibility to learn everything that is known. Now that didn't mean to learn everything about a particular area of study. No. Henry Adams was challenged by his father to learn everything that was ever known. Period. Even back in 1855, that would have been a daunting challenge. How much tougher that would be today. Over the last two decades, human knowledge has exploded to the point that what was breakthrough research last week is kind of old no news by this week. You can attend school every day of your life and still not begin to take in everything that was known in a single narrow subfield, let alone within a whole culture or society. But whether it be 1855 or 2012, there's one thing that still remains true. No matter how much you know, or how much you claim to know, there are still things the mind will never be able to comprehend. Things that science will never be able to resolve. Things that research will never be able to discover. And the Bible is full of such things. The Bible is chock full of claims that are mind-boggling. And perhaps people have been around the Holy Book for so long that you don't really listen anymore to what it's really saying. But consider these examples. The Bible says God made the universe in six days. Now humans can barely reach the moon in six days, let alone the outer farthest galaxies. That takes light years. Yet with a casual tone, we say God made it all up in six days. Exodus tells us that God split open the Red Sea so people of Israel could escape the onrushing chariots of the Egyptian army. And they passed through on dry land, and then the waters closed back up. A few books later, the Bible says that God caused the sun to stand still for 24 hours so that the Jewish leader Joshua could win a battle. Now true, there are several ways to look at such assertions. Some people dismiss these claims as mythology or hyperbole or poetic, poetic license. Some insist these claims should not be taken literally but should be read through the lens of critical scholarship. There is, of course, one other possibility that almost hurts to consider. And that is, could it be simply that there are some things that are not meant to be known as far as our minds are concerned? That it rightly needs to stay within the realm of God. The Bible says Jesus walked on water. It says he fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. It says he healed the sick and gave sight to the blind by the mere laying on of his hands. Most mind-boggling of all surrounds the birth and death of Jesus. The gospel says that at the beginning of his life, Jesus was born of a virgin. And at the end of his life, he was raised from the dead. On matters like these, it doesn't matter if you and I, like Henry Adams, learn everything that has ever been known throughout history or not. Because those two claims will never be able to be fully comprehended by humans. Because they dwell within the realm of miracle and mystery. Paul Simon 
song Slip Sliding Away says it well. When God makes his plan, the information is unavailable to the mortal man. And it's amazing the denials you'll hear, hear people say when they try to explain away the virgin birth. They'll say, I just don't see it. Or you'll never be able to convince me of that. Or they'll declare, there ain't no way in the world that is true. Yet we, as Christians, if we are faithful believers, if we want to reap the benefits of God's love, we must find a way to respond to those kind of naysaying statements. Though the claims may be incredible, so must be the depth of our faith commitment. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul makes a case for why the belief in Christ's resurrection is central to the Christian faith. Paul writes, If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then you and I will be forever entrapped by sin. If God did not raise Christ from the dead, there's no possibility then that we can be raised. But that still leaves us with the claim that Jesus was born of a mother who was, at the time of his birth, still a virgin. It's a birth that baffles the mind. Matthew 1 tells us that when Jesus was born, God brought to fulfillment an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 14, 714. The prophet that says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. And Jesus went on to fulfill over 100 such prophecies from the Old Testament. But just for the, today, in honor of Christmas, let's just focus on that one subject, the virgin birth. Many of us might be desperate for a logical explanation. For something that makes sense. Now one possibility could be the inconsistencies of the translations, especially when you compare the King James Version with other modern versions. Let me give you an example. The King James says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. The New International Version, the NIV, softens that up a bit and says, a young woman shall conceive and bear a child. And our own translation, the New Revised Standard Version, simply says, a young woman shall be with child. So, when you look up the Hebrew word and see that it means Alma, and it literally means young woman of marriageable age, People can go, aha! Because Mary, perhaps Mary didn't have to be a virgin. Only a youthful girl, married or unmarried. The details don't matter. It's not that important. But the trouble is, when the possibility of two human parents come into the picture, God becomes unnecessary. To some people, that's problem solved. Science triumphs over God once again. However, I stand before you today as a minister of word and sacrament to suggest that the claim of the virgin birth should not be so easily dismissed. Because there's more at stake than whether or not a Hebrew word is translated the right way or not. What is at stake is our whole sense of the ability of God to perform miracles. Of God to do mighty acts. Of doing all the things, what it says in the Bible, that God does. Any lesser belief waters down the power of God. When we say the virgin birth really wasn't a virgin birth, it diminishes God. It puts God under our feet instead of above and in front of our eyes. 
Psalm 77 says, you are the God who works miracles. You are the one who has displayed your might among the peoples. Let me give you three quick reasons why Christians ought to leave biblical mysteries alone. First, the virgin birth helps point to the fact that God is sovereign and we are not. God is almighty, we are not. And I don't know about you, but it brings comfort to the soul to know that there's something out there bigger than ourselves. That we always have something to turn to. That God was there before the beginning and will be there after the end. That's some pretty big territory. We can talk about DNA and the latest scientific discoveries, how every cell of the human body contains full encrypted information for the total functioning of the human race. But even so, we're just one small drop it in the bucket. And if you consider the universe a drop of bucket compared to the whole ocean, there's a lot of ocean out there. In other words, we're limited. We're limited in what we know. Isaiah 55 says, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Just how in the book of Job, when Job is complaining about, why, Lord, do I have such a terrible life? Why am I in so much misery? Why am I in so much hardship? God replies, not by answering him, but if you're even qualified to have a question and answer session with the Almighty. God asked Job, who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, friend, when you ask questions like that, you're in way over your head. God goes on to ask Job, can you order lightning bolts when to flash across the sky? Can you command the sun when to shine? Can you put water in the clouds? So the virgin birth needs to go into that category of accepting that it's bigger than what we can understand. And second, the virgin birth gives light to the majesty and power of God. Christians need to believe that there's nothing God cannot do, even when God doesn't have anything to work with. We talked about how Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist when people thought that she was too old. Of course, the same thing happened with Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was considered too old. I was reading last week in the Bible, Samson, the strong man who married Delilah, his mother was considered too old to have a baby. Yet it happened. And if we buy into those miracles, why not the virgin birth? All of the, this lack of belief prompts God to ask the question, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything that God cannot do? And obviously the answer is nothing. When we place the virgin birth side by side with problems of today, we see that nothing is ever too hard for God to solve. As long as we're alive, we've got a shot at overcoming, of healing, of reconciling, of attaining what we've asked for. With nothing in God's hands, God made the heavens and earth. And we've got some pretty good cooks and bakers in our mix, but what happens if I ask Peg Waitman to make me a great cake, but to do it without any ingredients? No flour, no sugar, no milk, no butter. And I think good as our bakers and cooks are, you have to start out with something in your hands, but not God. God can make something out of nothing. And that leads me to my final point. The virgin birth helps to fulfill the mission of God through Jesus Christ. 
The Bible teaches that you and I are born into a cycle of sin. That it's a natural condition. We're inclined to our disobedience and mistrust. We're prone to wander away from God. By nature, we're selfish and cynical. But just as Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again, we need to be born again. We need to be saved from ourselves. Because if we don't, we have the ability to do ourselves in. And we deserve to die, yet God forgives us and lets us live. So by being born without a human father, but by being conceived by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is born outside this realm of sin. And that's why we can say in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was like us in every way, except he was without sin. Humanity needed someone to take the penalty of death upon himself. We needed someone who's not guilty. We needed an unblemished lamb, like it says in the Old Testament. But Jesus was qualified, and he was worthy. And that is God's mission, of course, to restore relationships, to provide someone who could do something for us that we could not do for ourselves. So the virgin birth, which we'll celebrate next week, cannot be explained or understood by mortals. It can only be understood and received by faith. And I have no idea how a young woman who's never been with a partner can bear a child. But I am prepared to accept by faith what my mind cannot easily accept. Revelations 5.12 Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen.